Ready? Okay. Good morning, everybody. We welcome you on this uh, wonderful Father's Day. We're so thankful you're here. For those of you that are here in the auditorium and those joining us online, we thank you for coming and being with us today. I'd like to read from Psalm 34, verses 8 through 10. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Amen? Amen. God bless you this morning as we worship him together. Good morning, folks. Happy Father's Day. We'll get to that a little bit later. If you are able to join us in worship, we're going to start our morning singing about how amazing God's grace has been to us over the years. And if you're able to stand, join us.
I can invite our children up who would like to sing with us. Good, good father. We've got some excellent singers here this morning. So encourage them with your smile. Yes, gather around. Fathers, enjoy this and take pictures. so thankful that you uh, called us your children and uh, we are so loved by you your most precious 
masterpieces, Lord. And so we thank you and we honor uh, the fathers here this morning who have uh, just loved on us. And so we just thank you once again for your unfailing love towards us, your children. In your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and greet each other on your way down. Well, good morning, Torrance First Baptist. Good morning. So your favorite youth minister duo is back. You. To, uh, yeah, and we, oh. And again, we come bearing gifts. So um, oh, yeah. obviously it is a day meant for either fathers or mothers. So today it is Father's Day. How do you say Father's Day in Korean? Um, it's... Happy Abujina. Oh. But it's funny because my dad's not Korean. He's white. So your dad's Norwegian? Yeah, my dad's okay. Norwegian. What would Norwegian Father's Day be? Happy Father's Day in Norwegian is go Farsdag. Okay. So yeah, if anyone's Norwegian. Uh, go Farsdag. For Tagalog, it is Malgayang Ara ng mga tatay. So for any Filipinos way longer. there. <laughs> <laughs> But for all you normal English-speaking Americans, happy Father's happy Day Happy Father's you. Day. So clap it up for the fathers. Yeah. Clap it up for the fathers. Go you. So today, um, yeah, we Give have... the breakdown. Yeah, we come bearing gifts, but you got to earn it. And the th <laughs> good thing is that you don't have to do anything. It's literally just something that you might have done before. So well, you, you it's a challenge. You have had to procreate, of course. Of course, yes. So, yeah, so you have for to those be, in that category. So, we can't win these. So, sad. yeah. Um, so, first question what are we doing? Yeah, the first question is which father or which, yeah, which father has most recently had a child? So, anybody have a one year old right now? Raise your hand. One year old? Stand up, stand up if yeah, you've had if, a father, if, you, if you've been a father if you have recently. A one year old, two year old, one year old. Okay. Steve? Two-year-old. Two-year-old, okay. Any, any father that's younger than that? Or, I mean. Tom, you stood up, so I <laughs> thought you were. <laughs> Anyone? It, there's no one younger than two-year-old. No? Okay. All right, Steve. Steve, give All it right. to Steve. I'll run this up to you later. Yeah, <laughs> or, or Megan, I don't know. We'll get it to you. That's right. Oh. He's preparing for the next time we ask this, next year. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. The next one, all right, is actually, which father has traveled the longest distance for their child? So this could be a soccer tournament, dance recital. Maybe your child really wanted to go to concert and you drove them way the heck out of nowhere and then you traveled the furthest distance for them. So let's just say, oh, okay. Or if, you're, if your child was in a band and they oh, had yeah, to that's perform true. really far. Anything for your child. Stand if you feel yeah, like you've traveled yeah. far for your child. If you at least went two towns, okay? Okay. Oh, this might be a good one. Where have you guys gone? Where have you guys gone? Let's start in the back. All the way in the back. Yes. yes. To wow. New York. <laughs> Some people are sitting down. Chris. To where? To Toronto. Oh, Toronto. Do we have to Google that to oh, see? We have to Google I don't even it. know where Toronto is. Just kidding. <laughs> so, would that be far? Would no okay. Wow. Iceland. Is that even a country? It, has anybody gone farther than Iceland? 
All right, give it up for Harry. Hey, next time you guys go, let me know. I, I love Iceland. We backpack all through it. I just love the Icelandic people. So you let me know. So all right. What's our last question? What do the we got? last question is this, okay? Which father had their firstborn at the oldest age? My dad actually had me really late in life, and I'm his firstborn, so he would give you guys a run for your money. But let's just say, all right, if you had your, your child after 30 years old, all right, go ahead and stand up. First child after 30. For your firstborn, yeah, your firstborn after 30 years old. Ooh. Oh, we got a pastor in the mix. All right, we, we got a couple. Okay, let's just start yelling ages. Pastor Raj, let's go with you. 42. Your first child at 42. Okay. A lot of people <laughs> sat down. Wait, we have one more contender in the back. He's, lo he's just loading. 48. 48? Firstborn? Your firstborn? We have a winner, okay. Raj, it was a close second. You were right there. Yeah, my dad was 38, so he wouldn't want anything. Yeah. Everybody give it up for Don. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna ask just to close out this time. Uh, again, happy Father's Day. We're so happy you could join us, especially those watching online as well. But I'm gonna ask Jeremy just to close our time, blessing all the men and the fathers in the room, and then the sons as well. So let's go ahead and pray. You may bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day to honor the fathers in our life, God. Thank you so much for, um, for their presence, for blessing them with the ability to lead their households, God, in your ways. Um, Lord God, we also want to take this time to just pray for those who this day might not be the happiest of days. Lord, um, there are some of us who our fathers may be recently or have not recently passed away. Um, maybe fathers who weren't the best example of what a good godly father is, Lord. And so, Lord, for those today, I pray that you may comfort and encourage them, Lord, with the fact that we, are, we have a heavenly father. God, a good, good father. One who did it better than any great father could here on earth, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for the example you gave. Lord, today may, may today be a day of blessing, of comfort, and of love. So we love you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, as the choir members who are present come up to join me in helping to lead worship, we're going to sing a couple hymns that are for Father's Day, starting with a Christian home. And we'll sing the first two stanzas together, and then we'll, the, the next two stanzas will be just the men singing. And I'll cue you in on that. If you actually want to turn in those green things in front of you, those hymnals, they're back in the pews. You're welcome to do that. The lyrics, the lyrics will be overhead, of course, so you can do that. But the first song is 451, uh, Christian Home, and then the men will sing four, after that 455. Let's stand together as we sing A Christian Home. The Bible read 
the precious hymn still sung. Where prayer comes first, in peace or in disaster, and praise is natural speech to every tongue. Where mountains move before a faith that's vaster, and Christ sufficient is for old and young. Now just the men. I am a man appointed by my Savior to show his love in all I do and say. His Holy Spirit is my source of power to live in life and point to Christ the way. Lord, fill me That as your man, I'll serve your cause today. I'll be a man who walks with God in worship. I'll be a man who walks with men as friend. I'll be a man loves and serves his family. I'll be a man on whom God can depend. Lord Jesus Christ, my King and my Commander, I'll be your man until my life shall end. Great commitment, men. Now we're going to sing a song right from the scripture, Joshua 24, 15. It's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Come and fill our home with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Sing that again. Come into your fill with your presence. You alone are worthy of our reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Amen. Good singing. Let's pray. Father God, may we as your children truly live out what we've just sung. May we and our family serve you wholeheartedly because you alone are worthy of our worship and our service. We pray for the fathers in our lives. Help them to grow in their relationship with you, Lord and to grow as godly men who fear you and walk in your ways as they serve their families and live their lives in service to you. Bless them especially today as we honor them and bless their families for your glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. I just got a cheer from Matt, so I'm ready. Who's ready today? Thanks, Matt. 
What an encouragement. <laughs> hey, I'm excited to uh, wish happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. So just want to wish you happy Father's Day and hope that you're blessed. And like Jeremy said earlier, we know that today is not a happy day for all of you. My, own, my father went home to be with the Lord quite a few years ago, so sometimes it brings a little sadness, a little sorrow, but I'm also very thankful for the three wonderful children that I have and who uh, I get to spend this day with. So thank you, fathers, for pouring into your kids. And if you don't do that, do that, please. Pour into them. Love them. Teach them about Jesus so that one day they will give their hearts and their lives to Jesus our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Um, now, there is another side to parenting, to being a father, um, a side that's not always fun. And I know I was guilty of this quite often. My brother, who's sitting back over here, um, he and I would sit in the back seat of the car and uh, say things like, are we there yet? How many more miles? Oh my goodness, stop touching me. If you touch me one more time, I'm going to punch your lights out. All of those kind of fun things that my dad loved to hear. And then he would like reach his hand back and try to like get us like that. And it was, oh my goodness, it was kind of crazy. So um, uh, we, 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 uh, we lived up to these names. Whiner, crybaby, bellyacher, fuss budget. Griper, grumbler, crabby pants, grumpy, grouch, grinch, curmudgeon, sourpuss, party pooper, wet blanket. And I'm sorry if this is your name. Debbie Downer, Negative Nancy, Nervous Nelly, and my new favorite, and again, I'm sorry if this is your name, Karen If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm sorry. I don't have time to get into it today. Just look it up on YouTube and you'll see. Exactly. Don't be a Karen, right? Nobody likes a complainer, right? Nobody likes someone who's just constantly complaining and whining and crying and griping and moaning and all of these things that I just said, right? None of us is that complainer though, right? Never. Never. Dad, are we there yet? Never. Honey, when's dinner going to be ready? Oh, never right? Uh, hmm. Lord, where's the beef? Sorry, no. Uh, last week, in response to what God has done at the Red Sea, Israel bursts into praise, right? If you remember last week, who was here last week? What a blessing that was. Like, we spontaneously just worship Jesus. Nothing but the blood. Amen. And it was so great to see Israel just cry out in praise to God and our church to cry out in praise to God. In adoration, in worship, we, we gained some helpful insights into how we ought to worship the Lord. This week, though, man, that mountaintop experience, it's pretty much over now. Anybody ever experienced that before? You go up to the mountain, maybe to camp, like literally you're in the mountains, and you're like on fire for Jesus, you're just worshiping the Lord, and then you come down that mountain, and it's like, Dad, are we there yet? One more time. What's going on? We get off that mountain, and, and Israel is off the mountain. They're, they're going to begin their wilderness wanderings. They're, they're going to question uh, everyday existence of, of life and, and, and wonder where the necessities are going to come from. It's going to cause them to complain against Moses. They're going to complain against his brother Aaron. They're going to complain against God. The question is for each of us today, is he, like the kids saying, awesome job kids, yay, is he a good, good father? Is he a good, good father? Is he the father of lights who from every good and perfect gift comes from, right? Is he a good, good father? And if he is, how many of us would say he is a good, good father? Amen. Then why do we complain so much? Why did Israel complain so much? Why do we struggle with that issue of complaining and whining and crying? I wonder if it's because we're human, yeah? Probably that's the reason. But let's begin our time together in prayer. Will you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you once again so much for your word. Lord, we do know that there are mountaintop experiences where we worship you with all that we are and all that we have, and we feel so close to you, but we also know that sometimes we will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But may we, like the psalmist, realize that even though we walk through that valley, you are with us, your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You guide us, you prepare a, a table 
uh, in your presence so that we can dine with you, so that we can be with you. I pray that in the midst of some things that might be difficult for us to deal, the trials, the temptations that come our way, that we would always see the hand of the good, good Father reaching out for us, providing so that we can have life with you and ultimately the greatest gift that you gave, your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Before we begin today in Exodus chapter 15, I do want to give a shout out to all of you who came to our work day yesterday. We had over 60 of us come out. And from what I gathered, that was probably the biggest crowd that we've ever had. So praise the Lord for that. The old, young men, women, children, everywhere in between. Did anybody see the dumpster in the parking lot? Yeah, we got a bunch of pack rats here at this church, huh? <laughs> but now we got a lot of trash. But guess what? We've thrown out the trash. Now we're bringing in, bringing in the good stuff, right? The gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be proclaimed and preached, and the word of God is going to continue to stand firm, and we're going to stand firm on it. So let's open up to chapter 15 of the Exodus. Will you open up with me verses 22 through 27 to begin our time? Read with me, please. It says, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of, of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. And then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. So Israel sets out from the Red Sea. They're led by Moses into the wilderness of Shur, and here they encounter a problem. Where are we going to find water? In the words of Willy Wonka, water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. Yes, I am that nerd. Okay, so they can't find water. It's a legit question, though, because with so many people in livestock, they would need a large source of drinkable water. I'm sorry, no desalinization plants in those days. So they couldn't just go to the Red Sea and change it into drinkable water. And they were almost at the end of their rope after wandering for three days in a place that even though it was named Shur, was anything but sure. And so here they are coming to the Lord at the, end of their, at the end of their rope. But just when they think they've made it, they find this water source. It turns out that this water source is bitter. My wife likes to put lemon essential oil in her water. I don't know what it is, and I'm not throwing you under the bus, honey. But uh, when I want to get a cold drink of refreshing water, and I grab her water because I never provide my own. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, uh, my dear, for providing this water. And I pick that water up and I take a drink. And then my mouth like puckers up because I'm expecting water. And what do I get? Some lemony rind tasting thing that to me, it's, it's, it's just yuck. And uh, by the way, can anyone explain to me a baby's fascination with slices of lemon? You ever see that? Like, they love them. They just, like, you eat them, and their face goes all like this. That's, like, double yuck to me. Like, eat a, a, who, does anybody like to eat straight lemon? You're so weird. Okay, but anyways. Um, but that's the expectation, right? You go expecting this sweet water, and you get something that's sour, that's bitter. And that's what the people, they were expecting this. And it was so bitter, they actually named the place Mara, which means bitter. Go figure. And, of course, the honeymoon now is over. The mountaintop experience is over. They are down out of the mountain, and what happens? Reality hits them. Bring on the grumbling. Notice, this time, they complain against Moses, and they don't even, they, they don't even ask him to cry out to the Lord on, on their behalf, and, and they definitely don't cry out to the Lord um, as well. How soon they forget the provision of the Lord. If we follow the timetable, Literally only three days have passed since the great miracle 
of the Red Sea and this song that they sing. Three days have passed, and here they are grumbling and complaining. They're desperate, no doubt. The body needs water. Try to go without water for three days. I think you might be dead, but the body, you know. So it is, it is a difficult thing, but they're desperate, and they, they quickly lose trust. They lose trust. John Calvin said this. He said, God might have given them sweet water to drink at first, but he wished by the bitter to make prominent the bitterness which lurked in their hearts. And I want us to think about that for a second. Because sometimes what happens when we deal with the difficulties of life is our first thing is to just be bitter about it. And we do become a Karen <laughs> because we're just bitter. And, uh, and, and, but I think that the Lord wants us to see that in him we can find all the sweetness that we need. Now, sadly, we know this is a recurring theme all throughout the Exodus, right? This is a recurring theme throughout this wilderness journey. Over the next few chapters and much of numbers, and ultimately it will lead to that generation not even being able to enter the promised land because of their bitterness and their grumbling and their disobedience of the Lord. Now, how might this apply? to you and I. How might we see this? John McKay says, it's God's normal way of working that entering into glory does not immediately follow salvation. Wouldn't that be the easiest thing, right? Just glorify me right now, and I'm good to go. But that's not the way it happens, right? We're, we are saved, and our glorification is assured, but in the meantime, we just have to live this crazy life, right? And deal with all the trials and temptations and the fears and the anxieties and bad guys out to get us. And, uh, but God, he, that's not what he does. Rather, there's a time of preparation to make his people ready for the inheritance he will bestow on them. And that was the method he followed in the case of the Israelites. He wanted them to be ready to enter that promised land. So he had to walk them through the wilderness. And they showed once over and over again that they weren't ready, sadly. And free though they were from the hand of the Egyptians, they still had much to learn. And isn't that you and I? How many of us are free in Jesus? Amen. We're free in Jesus. But how much more do we have to learn? How much more do we have to learn? And it would take, it takes time, right? It took time for their trust to, in the Lord to develop. And so it's the same for us. It reminds me of what James says in James 1, 2 through 4. He says, count it all, what? Joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or perseverance. And let steadfastness or perseverance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Uh, the Friends in Christ uh, Sunday school life group, we're going through James. And last week I shared that to count something as joy means that you actually have to take time to consider it, right? Because I look at a trial and I don't go, yay, happy, happy, joy, joy. I want to do a dance, right? That's not what I say. What I say is, man, this is hard. This is difficult. So I actually have to take that trial and say, you know what? Even though this is so hard to deal with right now, I'm going to count it as joy. Why? Because I know that God is doing something through it. He's doing something in me. So the next time we're tempted to grumble and complain, let's remember that. What is God trying to do? What is he trying to show us? What is he trying to teach us through this moment? Um, and, and hopefully as we grow in our relationship with Christ, we'll continue to become more and more mature in how we respond to those difficulties that come our way. And so we have this sweet water now. Even though they grumble against him, Moses cries out to God, and God provides the most natural sweetener, much better than our sweeteners that come in all sorts of little colored packets. You know, little blue ones and pink ones. And all that. Yuck, right? The sweetener this time, what's the sweetener? It's a log. Mmm. Anybody ever taste a log before? Really sweet, right? Uh, double yuck. Anyway, the log does its job. <laughs> the water becomes sweet, but the taste in Moses' mouth at this point must have been a little bit bittersweet, not to mention the Lord's disappointment at their lack of faith. And this is why we see in the second half of verse 25 
that he then makes a statute or a command accompanied by a promise. He says this, if you listen to what I say, if you do what I say, if you keep my commands, I will not visit the plagues upon you like I did to Egypt because I am the Lord. I am your healer. God has revealed himself as Yahweh Rophe, right, which is the God who heals. In the Old Testament, Rophe refers to wellness and soundness physically and spiritually. It means to restore, to heal, to cure, not only in the physical sense, but in the moral and spiritual sense also. And so to trust in that healer means no plagues, right? Implied, though, is the opposite. If we don't trust in the healer, if Israel didn't trust in the healer, watch out. Bloody water, boils, frogs, gnats, all those fun things that we discovered earlier this year. And as it says, this would serve as a test for their faithfulness. And then, if that wasn't enough that God provided this sweet water for them at that point in time, then as a further sign of his faithfulness, they come to Elam, which is basically a desert oasis the perfect amount of water, and shade enough for all. Remember, how many people are there? There's like millions of people. Shade enough for all, water enough for all. Perhaps they will think twice about questioning God's plan and his messenger Moses, given that God provides. It's just like, wait, it's right over the ridge. But how many of us, when we're dealing with trials and struggles, and do we, do we, is the answer right over that ridge? It's right over that, that bend. It's right around there. All we have to do is wait. May we be strengthened, knowing that his timing is perfect, right? And he is in the business of bringing us into his, into his presence, right? We question his plans. And we question also those who serve as his messengers, do we not? How many of us have blamed something on a pastor or on a youth worker or on, you know, a servant in the church? Or how many of us, you know, okay, all right, we got it. I love the honesty back here. Thank you. Um, we're, we're very quick to point fingers and point the blame. And now, granted, if, if those pastors or youth workers are not doing their job and they're being dumb, then yes, we should, you know, call them out for it. But most of the time it's due to our own preferences, the things that we like or don't like, and, or they may not have the right kind of color of hair. Or they may not be wearing the right kind of clothes for the day. I don't know, right? But we question that. Riken, Riken says this. He says, it's not a sin for us to bring God our problems. In fact, he invites us to talk things over with him through prayer. What is a sin, however, is to have a complaining spirit that poisons our communion with Christ and thus robs us of the joy of serving God. How many of us, because we're so complaining, lose sight of the joy of the Lord? And we, we're, we're too busy doing, you know, you know, the whole pointing thing. You ever seen any teachers out there use this with your kids, like your kindergarten teacher? How many fingers are pointing back at you when you point at somebody else? That's right, three. Anyways, if you didn't know that, there you go. Uh, useless info. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you. I know I'm full of these fun ones today. Our song should be this, though. Um, even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. And yes, Jeremy, that was just for you today. He is a father who provides. The next section then is quite long and it repeats details. So rather than reading the whole thing up front, we'll go through it, highlighting key points along, along the way. It's 36 verses. We're going to get through all of the whole chapter 16. Okay, it's 11:15. Can we do it? Nobody better be looking at your watches. If you have reservations at a restaurant, just leave quietly. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyways, so we've got this, uh, this, new, this new example of the complaining from the people of Israel. More grumbling. So verse 1 through 3, they set out from Elam and all the congregation of the people of Israel come to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses 
and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Okay, so the people set out from their Palm Springs vacay, and they journey into the wilderness of sin. Nothing ominous about that, right? We're about a month or so now out of Egypt, and immediately the grumbling begins anew. This time, not only does Moses face the brunt of their complaints, but it's also Aaron, his brother, who gets it as well. Silvaggio points out, once again, Israel revealed a heart of faithlessness and ingratitude. The song of victory at the banks of the Red Sea had fully faded from their memory and from their lips. They were no longer exalting God and trusting in Moses. They were bitterly complaining against God and ready to rebel against Moses. The complaint this time, we're starving. Sounds like my house 24-7. And that's just me. Notice <laughs> the exaggeration as well. Much like before, they wish well, we'd never left Egypt, or at least that the Lord had killed them there so that they wouldn't have to deal with the starvation. Remember those good old days. Yeah, you remember those days when we were slaves? Such good old days, right? We were, we were slaves, and, and we had to do this hard, hard work, and we didn't have freedom. Yay for those good old days. Man, those were good days. You brought us here to starve us to death. First, I want to say this. Wow, God went to a lot of trouble with a bunch of plagues and a crossing of the Red Sea only to kill them now. I don't know if God would want to work that way. And also, let's think about the food. Could it have really been that plentiful as they were slaves doing this backbreaking work? Do you really think Egypt like fed them and they sat around the fire singing Kumbaya eating meat pots? whatever those are, and bread to the full. Do you really think that that's what was going on? Yeah, right. I don't think so. Now, let's think about the nature of our complaints for a second, though. Okay, ready for this? Where, where do they come from? Why are, why are certain people more apt to complain than others? Are, are the things that we complain about really worth complaining about? Is the grass always greener on the other side? Really? No, sometimes if you get to that other side, it turns out the grass is even worse than your grass is. Philip Ryken says this. He says, our complaints really are never caused by our outward circumstances. Instead, they reveal the inward condition of our hearts. The scripture says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say it again, rejoice, right? Philippians 4.4. 4. Our joy in the Lord should not be circumstantial, but it should be fundamental. Our complaining spirit always indicates a problem in our relationship with the Lord. And if we really knew the joy of the Lord, perhaps our complaints would either go away or they would change from something negative to positive. Like we see in the Psalms of Lament, throughout the Psalms, there's so many Psalms of Lament, where the psalmist do, they cry out to God, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will my enemies triumph over me? But at the end of each of those, they come to a place of remembering God's faithfulness and his provision. Do you and I do that? When we see the world crumbling around us, do we go back to a place where, okay, God, but I know you provided in that time, and I know you're going to provide again. Just help me to see it. We should always go to him first and be mindful of his faithfulness. And so let's move on. Verse 4 and 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and they shall gather a day's portion every day. Then I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And on the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And so, and we'll stop right there. Sorry. So God gives them basically the study guide, right? Back to our school metaphors from last week. Um, he interjects before Moses can even get a word out. Listen, I'm about to rain bread from heaven. I'm about to rain bread from heaven. Okay? Cloudy with a chance of meatballs has nothing on God. He's about to rain bread from heaven. Again, I think it's a story that we've heard so often that we take it for granted. Right? We take for granted this, this story of, of, of manna from heaven. The sky is literally going to open up and bread will fall. 
Skeptics have tried to point to naturally occurring phenomena like lichen that produces pea-sized globules that they would eat. You know what lichen is? Anybody? It's, it's, like, uh, it's like fungus. It's like moss. It's nasty. Okay. Try eating some of that. Here's the other one. Ready? This is my favorite. A plant louse. Yes, a louse, which if you don't know what that is, think of lice when you're a little kid, okay? A plant louse sucks the sap from these trees and transforms it into high fructose products. Maybe you'll think second about eating high fructose corn syrup now, right? Which are then secreted through their bodies falling to the ground, which then crystallize into small white pellets, which can then be consumed like sugar or honey. <laughs> Yummy. In all seriousness, do you really think that's how God provided manna for them? Yet some actually posited that that was it. In all seriousness, God is a father who provides despite the whining of his children. And he links this provision of bread with obedience to the law. He calls it a test. Will they follow his commands concerning the gathering of this bread or not? They want his provision, his blessing, the good things that he provides. But are they willing to do their part by responding in obedience? As Jesus said in his own desert temptation, quoting Deuteronomy 8, 3, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Later, after he feeds the 5,000, when he's asked for a sign like manna from heaven, he links it to himself and he says in John 6, 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. You see, Jesus knew that our deepest needs are not physical, but spiritual. And what you and I really need is Jesus himself. And what he freely gives us is himself. He provides. Is Israel willing to put their trust in God to provide? Are you and I? Charles Spurgeon, great preacher, described the desert as this. He said it was the Oxford and Cambridge for God's students. There they went to the university and he taught and trained them. And they took their degree before they entered into the promised land. And this is why we so desperately need Jesus, because he did pass the test. He passed it in the desert, he passed it in the garden, and he passed it on the cross. Amen? Amen. And the details of the test are hashed out through the rest of the chapter. Bread will appear each morning, and Israel is a sign of their faith in God's provision, is only to gather enough for that day. Definitely gives us context for the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. And on the sixth day, they were to gather enough for two days so that they would follow the forthcoming law on the Sabbath, which is explicitly stated later. Provision of meat, specifically quail, is given each evening, right? Even though God's didn't really, God didn't really want to do that, we find that story in Numbers. But he still provides it for him. He still gives it to him. He still has grace on them. Now let's look at verse 6 through 12. Says this. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumblings, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but it's against the Lord. And then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of my people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I 
am the Lord your God. Then you shall know. Moses makes it repeatedly clear, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, and 12, that the Lord has heard their grumbling, and he gives them the message that these signs are that they may know that it was the Lord who brought them out of Egypt, that they would see the glory of the Lord, which we are told they do in verse 10 as they see that cloud. This is not a new message, though. Back in Exodus 6, 7, and 10, 2, he said essentially the same thing, that these signs were so they would know he is the Lord and that he would receive the glory. And then just because Moses would be like me, why are you complaining against me? I'm just the messenger, right? Moses says, don't complain against me. I'm not in charge. Who are Aaron and I who died and made us king? God's in charge, so please stop taking it out on us, he says. And then the test begins. The test begins in verse 13. Where it says, in the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake light thing, fine as frost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in the tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more and some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. As much as he could eat. We'll go ahead and stop right there. Now that the parameters of the test are revealed, as we see in verse 13, that test commences. No letter grades, no partial credit here. It's pass or fail. Didn't you hate those classes? Man, I like partial credit. But anyways, this is pass or fail. Quail comes in the evening. Bread comes in the morning. He gives even further specific instructions about how much they're to gather for the size of their families. Would they pass or fail? Well, first, it looks like they pass, right? They're going to they're pass with flying colors. They go out, they gather what they need. Literally, no matter how much they gathered, it measured out to as much as they could eat. Paul actually quotes this in uh, 2 Corinthians verse 8, 15, to encourage the church to give generously, and God will make sure their needs are met, which is exactly what happens here. Again, Lord of the Ring nerds out there, if you're with me, elvish limbus bread sustains in the wilderness. Oh, limbus bread. And they complain about it, and they whine about it, then they eat it, and they go, ah. That's good, and it sustains them. It doesn't seem like much, but it's exactly what they needed. I digress. Did they pass or fail? Well, here it seems like they pass, but let's go further. Verse 19, if you will, it says this. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until the morning, but they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. Okay, so test number two here. Um, part two of the test. Moses tells them not to leave any to the morning. This time, they don't listen. Some leave part till the morning. And guess what? Pass or fail? Fail. And of course, this breeds worms. Yuck. And it stinks. Double yuck. It's kind of like the food that gets left under the kid's bed, is it not? <laughs> After a week. It starts to stink, right? And uh, <laughs> Moses is angry, right? If I see that in my house, I'm angry too. But they're given another chance, just like I give other chances as well. Right, girls? They're looking at me like, Dad, stop. You're so embarrassing. Uh, but anyways, they're given another chance. The days go on. Sort of like a teacher who realizes that the whole class bombed the test and he gives them a redo. Thank you for those kind of teachers. And then we come to the next part, the next section of the test. Verse 22, I'm going to try to go quick through this, you guys. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord's commandment. Okay, number two on the test, right? Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil. All that's left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Yay. And Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather, but on the seventh day 
is a Sabbath, and there will be none. Okay, so test number three, the Sabbath. As I mentioned earlier, they, they give provision for this Sabbath day. We'll deal more of this, about this when we come to the Ten Commandments. But for now, to observe this solemn rest, the Sabbath day, as a gift from God so they can rest from their labors and they can worship Him, they're told to gather enough bread to prepare for the next day, right? Set it aside. Don't leave it till morning, or actually do leave it till morning, and this time no more worms and no more stink. Praise God. And what do they do? They do exactly what He says. So, all right, so I guess they're passing the test again. Well... Not so fast. He gives them a command and says, don't go back out on that seventh day and try to gather again. But what do they do in verse 27 through 30? Read with me. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on that seventh day. And so the people rested on the seventh day. So part four of the test, they gathered enough for those two days, yet some of them went out looking for more. How long is it going to take before they start really trusting God, before they fully obey him? How long is it going to take for us too? Um, God at this time is angry. He shows his anger. How long are you going to disobey me? How long are you not going to trust in my word? And yet once again, what does it show? It shows that he's gracious. He gives them a redo, and they respond. They rest on the seventh day. Thank God. Thank God for his mercies, which are new every morning. Because how many of us have failed to trust in him? How many of us have failed to really rely on his power, his strength in our lives, have questioned him? And yet his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And so we come then to the conclusion, some concluding remarks in verse 31 and following. It says, Now the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like coriander seed, white. The taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses says, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generation so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness. Then I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar, put an omer of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. And the people of Israel ate the manna for 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is the tenth part of an ephah. So we have these concluding remarks. Israel names the bread manna, which sounds like the question they asked when it first appeared. And I would ask that question too if I saw on the ground laying some white coriander seeded honey taste and bread just appeared on my lawn. I would say, what is it? So if you were wondering what manna means, that's what it means. What is it? <laughs> One reason this might be here is I think it's revealed by what comes next. The Lord tells them to keep this jar of it throughout their generations as a perpetual reminder of the provision and faithfulness of God. Eventually, this will end up with the testimony or the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, right? That will be placed in the Ark of the Covenant. But that's a story for another day. But finally, we're told that they continued to eat the manna every day for 40 years until they reached Canaan. Joshua 5.12 says, The manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land, and there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Thus, the bread of heaven will sustain the people as they wander through the wilderness. Now, friends, I want to ask you this today. Are we being sustained by the bread of life Jesus Christ? Or are we being sustained by the world and all of its trappings? I'm going to speak specifically to the fathers right now, and this obviously is to myself. Fathers, are we feeding our children what they need to be fed? Are we providing that spiritual foundation, that leadership for our children? And if we are not it's time to stop going out the next day and gathering where we're not supposed to gather. It's time to trust in the Lord and allow him to do the work and set that pattern this day for our children so that when they grow old, they will not depart from it. Dads, will you stand with me in this? 
Is this the challenge that we can live by? Grandpas, uncles, future dads who one day will have children. So I'm speaking to the young ones too. Will we, will we be sustained by the Lord Jesus Christ? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a great German pastor who basically gave his life in, in World War II, wrote this. We too pass through the Red Sea, through the desert, across the Jordan, into the Promised Land. With Israel, we fall into doubt and unbelief and, and through punishment and repentance experience again God's help and His faithfulness. All this is not mere reverie, but holy, godly reality. We are torn out of our own existence and set down in the midst of the holy history of God on earth where God deals with us and He still deals with us, our needs and our sins, yes, sometimes in judgment, but praise God in grace. How thankful I am for His grace. So what trials are we facing today? What temptations are besetting us today? What are our real needs today? And what is our response? Are they causing us to grumble and complain? And God forbid, be a Karen? Are they making us dissatisfied with God? Maybe dissatisfied with the church even? Let's take a moment. I'm going to ask the band to come up. I just want us to be silent. And just ask the Lord to search our hearts for those areas of complaint and ask for wisdom to be able to count the trials as joy, to rest in his perfect plan and his provision because, yes, he is a good, good father. So will you bow with me and take a moment of silence? Just ask the Lord. Let him do some business today. Lord, I know as a father I fall short. And I know that there are some in this room who feel like they're failures. Because our, their kids have not followed you, their kids have not remained in the, in the church and are walking in the world. Lord, I pray that today you would show us again your mercies. And that from this day forward, we would not stop pointing to you, Jesus. Showing our children so that they may show their children and so that they may show their children the blessing that comes for, from living a life that is fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. That, that values your word. That, that values gathering together with the body of Christ, that, that wants to serve you. Not just so that we can clean out some closets of old junk at the church, but because it develops within us character. And it points others to the source of why we do these good things. Because all of these come from our good, good Father, the Father of lights, who gives us every good and perfect gift. And for that, we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Band, will you lead us, please? Gentlemen, young and old, we would like to sing a blessing over you, so would you mind standing for us, young and old gentlemen? As Penelope leads us in a blessing, ladies, join with her as well.
Ladies, will you stand to and join us, please, as we close our service? Penelope, my goodness. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you go in his name today, declaring forth his praises, because he is a good, good father. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Dear family, God bless you too. We love you.